so glad you came to worship the King with us this morning. We're going to sing about how he set us free today. Jesus has paid the price for us today. Sing this out together. Go on. Go on and speak against my borrowed innocence. The judge is my defense. I'm going free. Right when the gavel fell, I heard the freedom hell ring through the heart of hell. I'm going free. I'm going free. We'll sing this out together. Glory, glory. So glory, glory. Sing this out. 
secrets are golden And every chain is broken Oh, I wanna go Oh, I wanna go home Where every fear is gone In your open arms Just where I It's where I belong I'm going home I'm going home Yes, I'm on my way home I'm going home Stand to our feet as we continue to worship this morning. Do you believe you have a home waiting for you in heaven? It doesn't compare to this life. Everything is perfect. Every tear will be wiped away. And we know that's true because we have a promise maker and he is a promise keeper. Let's sing that out this morning. Promise maker. Keeper, you finish what you begin. You're our provision through the desert. You see it through to the end. Yes, you do. God, you see it through to the end. We sing this out together. The Lord our God. The Lord our
You're all we need, Lord. We give you praise. Thanks so much for lifting your voice to him this morning, church. You may be seated at this time. Join with me in prayer, please. Father God, we come before you today, Lord, grateful for your blessing. Your blessing of life, your blessing of giving us new life through your death, burial, and resurrection. And today, Lord, as we deal with anger, Lord, we, we just see in our culture, it's, it's an underlying issue. It seems like everybody is angry. And Lord, help us to see from your word where this anger comes from, how destructive it is, and what the answer and solution to it is. We pray in Jesus' holy name. If you pray with me, church, say amen. amen. It's summertime in Michigan. How do I know that the orange barrels are out? <laughs> They're everywhere, aren't they? Now, if you're anything like me, your normal route has been adjusted somewhat. And I live close to work, but I already know what roads not to take, what roads not to get on unless you want to what? Suffer from the orange barrels. Now, here's what happens when they put those orange barrels up. They don't just, it's not that they're not there one day and the next day they're there. They put them on the side of the road, right? And they put them on the side of the road and you know, oh no, they're going to start doing work on this road, and I take this road every single day. And so they kind of get you ready, and they sit next to the road for a while, and, and then finally when they get ready to do it, uh, they'll put up a sign that says, beginning this date to this date, there's going to be construction in this area, right? And then they finally, the date comes, and they put the orange barrels out, and they shift traffic or, or wind traffic down, but they don't do it right there. They they tell you way back here, a mile from here, you're going to lose whether it's the left lane or the right lane or there's a bridge and, and, and you're, the traffic's going to adjust. And they tell you way before it happens. And so what do all the good people and the good drivers of Michigan do? Well, we all say to each other, seeing that we don't want to come to a standstill, we're going to all share the road... And we're going to start merging now so that the traffic slows down a little bit but gets through and everybody can, can you know, keep the traffic flow. Because that's what happens, right? No. And you're giggling about it because you know what happens. Now, this is a test of our Christianity right here. Because if you're a good Christian, you see the sign and you do what? You say, oh, well, I better merge but then there's that other voice that says, oh, don't be a fool. Because, <laughs> see, you're going to merge, and you're going to be a good driver, and all the other people are going to keep going in that lane that's disappearing, and they're going to go right up to where it ends, and then they're going to do this, which makes you a little angry. And so what do we do over in the line that we've merged into? We get within breathing room of the bumper in front of us, and we get as close as we can so those jerks, I mean people, <laughs> that are in the merge lane can't get in. And when we get up to them, we give them that one way to Jesus <laughs> sign. It happens every day. Every single day it happens. And what do we do? It gets our goat. We get angry. And, and sometimes we fume about it. And we, get, we start getting angry about it even before the sign says, you've got to merge in, in, in a mile. We get angry before the sign now because we know it's coming. We know it's coming. And you just know people are going to do that. That's what the book of James is all about. I've just basically given you an example of the whole letter of James. Because God says that our life is going to be under construction. And what does he do when it's under construction? When he's trying to get us to grow in grace and, and be more focused on getting the gospel out than letting life become just about me. What does he use? Difficulties, tests trials, 
things that we would never voluntarily sign up for, we complain about how bad the roads are. And when they go to fix them, we complain about them fixing them. No, I didn't get very many amens for that. <laughs> but that's what we do. And realize we live in a state where it's the Arctic for about four months, and they can't do road work then, so they got to kind of squeeze it in during the better weather months, which means more projects, more concentration of them. Yeah. And so let me get this straight. It's kind of like Christianity. We want to grow in Christ. We don't want to be stagnant. And so when he puts in instrumentally into our life the very things that will cause that growth to happen, the maintenance, the construction, we complain about that too. And, and so what do we do? Well, James says we start talking about it. And that's what we dealt with last week when we talk and we complain and, and we whine and we moan. And then when we don't get our way, we get angry. We get angry. Instead of recognizing this happens to all of us, and let's merge together, and let's realize it's for our good, and let's just keep motoring for Jesus, some people pull off and they're like, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. And they sit home, and, and they just, they're AWOL from living the Christian life. They're like, eh. Let somebody else sit in traffic. Hmm. Now, look at your introduction and turn in your Bibles to James, the fourth chapter. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can read on the screen or you can use the Bible in the pew right in front of you. But in the introduction, it says, when, when someone fails to manipulate the situation in life with their words, we often default to what? Anger. And this is anger based on, I'm not getting what I desire, what I think is right, what I think is good. We rarely are angry about the right things because the Bible tells us in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, to be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. So it's not that anger in and of itself is always wrong. We should be angry that the church today is not reaching the lost. That we should be angry about. We should be angry that our neighbors, many of whom have never heard about what Jesus did for them, they're dying in their sins, and they're going to spend eternity in torment. If we don't do something about it, we should be angry that we're okay with that. Yeah, amen. Those things we should be angry about. But what do we get angry about? We get angry about those guys in the merge lane. That's what we get angry about. And what this proves is that we have a worldly viewpoint. Anger, first of all, comes, James tells us, from a worldly view. What's a worldly viewpoint? It's very simply this. When we, as an individual, are at the center of our mindset, of our life philosophy, instead of Christ and his kingdom being at the center of our life, when it's my way, my will, my desires, what I want to happen at the center of my life, instead of Jesus Christ being at the center, I have a worldly viewpoint. Why are those people not getting in line and allowing traffic to flow? Because they're selfish. They're selfish. Bottom line. Is it, does anybody not understand that? Amen, they're basically saying, I'll say it this way, forget you guys over there in the merge lane. You're, you know, you're... You're dumb enough to sit over there. I'm going to get ahead of you because I don't care about you. I only care about me. That's the world's mindset. That's the world's mindset. It has been the world's mindset since the garden. When Adam and Eve ate that fruit, this nature, it's, it's called the sin nature or the worldly nature or our flesh nature, it came alive when they ate that fruit. And it has been messing with us ever since the garden. So let's look at what James says in verse, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, how that anger comes from a worldly viewpoint, me at the center of this world viewpoint. Verses 1 and 2 says, what is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from the cravings that are at war within you that you want to stay in the merge lane and get ahead of 20 cars? You desire... 
but you do not have. You murder and covet, it, and sometimes it goes to that, and we see it every day. Why did those people attack just pedestrians in London last night? They murder and covet. Right. There's a war going on inside of mankind. Why did Cain rise up and kill Abel? It wasn't about circumstances. It was about this rage that was inside of him. You desire, do not have. You murder and covet, cannot obtain. You fight and war. You do not have because you do not ask. So basically what James is saying, he's, he's reiterating what got us to this point. Why in trials many times we start complaining with our mouth and we start talking, and then when that doesn't get it, we turn to anger because we're, when affected by materialism, favoritism, and jealousy, fights are bound to happen. Say, well, I'm not going to use an example in church here. I'm going to use an example with Joseph and his brothers. You want to see fights? You want to see this war come about? Just take a brother and a family and raise one brother up. Because that's what God did with Joseph, right? Yes, he gave Joseph a favored position, and immediately when God blessed Joseph, what did all the other brothers do? Man, that's wonderful, Joseph. We are so thrilled. That's great. Man, I hope God keeps giving you those dreams. No, they got in the merge lane. And they tried to run them over. Now, did Joseph do anything that was wrong? Nope. Did he say anything that was wrong? Nope. There is no recorded sin in Scripture from the man named Joseph. But boy, his brothers had a corner on the market. This thing inside of them ate them alive to where they said, here comes that ugly, wicked dreamer. Let's kill him. Because why? Because that's going to fix it? That's going to take care of the rage that is within them? Amen. So they threw him in a pit, sold him to slavery, and thought, that's it. <laughs> We're done. Oh, no. Because from that point on in their life, any time anything went wrong, the immediate thing in their mind was, it's what we did to Joseph. They knew it. Yet mankind hasn't changed. You want to see fights in a church? Let somebody get blessed. <laughs> Let somebody get elevated. Oh, well, you know, that. And then the fights and the, the fighting, the favoritism, all that. Well, Peter and Paul write the same thing. Peter and 1 Peter 2, chapter, verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and temporary residents to abstain from fleshly desires that war against you. There's these desires within all of us that fight us and try to keep us from becoming spiritual beings. Paul says the same thing, Romans 7, 23, but I see a different law in the parts of my body waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. So when we get to this point, we forget even asking God. And then when life doesn't go our way, we start saying, well, this not involving God is, is not working. And so I'm just going to ask God, okay, well, I'm in, the merge, I'm in the merge lane. I'm passing by all these people. Lord, when I get up there, just create an opening for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. We don't recognize that it's, we don't recognize our selfishness. We don't say, man, this is wrong. This is so self centered of me. We say, no, God, bless my self centeredness. Bless it. Help me keep from growing in grace. Help me keep from knowing you further. Bless me with that, Lord. And he says, no. And so we go from not praying because we know it's silly to. Verse 3, we ask and we don't receive because we ask with wrong motives so that we may spend it on our evil desires. So if you're having prayer that are, is unanswered, it could be caused because you're seeking personal gratification while disregarding God's will. You know what God's will is? 
but you're disregarding it and saying, God, bless this mess. I've chosen this mess over your will. Bless it. And you know what? As a jealous God, which we're going to find, he wants to bless our life. He doesn't want us to be over in the merge lane having everybody give us the one way to Jesus sign. He wants to be good examples of God. So he's not going to bless that. And then he says in verse 4, he says, this is what it becomes spiritually in our life. He says, adulteresses or adulterers. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? So whoever wants to be the world's friend becomes God's enemy. So he causes this mindset where me first and God somewhere down the line, he calls that spiritual adultery, cheating on God with our heart. And so if you combine spiritual adultery with a voluntary blindness towards the seriousness of sin, what do you become? Even though we're children of God, we become the enemy of God's plan in our life. We get in the way of what God actually wants to use us to accomplish. That's why there's so many. Can I just say this? unhappy Christians. Have you ever wondered that? We should be zippity doo da. I mean, we should be way happier than the guy in Mary Poppins. Right? We should be way happier than Dick Van Dyke. But most Christians are what? Uh, I'm not even in the merge lane. I'm suffering for Jesus. Mm. Well, the great thing is that Paul tells us in Romans 5.10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more, having been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. When we come into a faith-based relationship with God through trusting in the work and person of Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross, being buried Paying for our sins on the cross, being buried and rising from the dead, when we confess our sins and, and identify with Christ and get born anew spiritually, that enmity, that hatred, that condemnation of God is forever put away. Okay? And we will be forever the children of God. And that's the great news. The bad news is, is that when we act this way, it's like we're temporarily putting on the other team's uniform. Even though we belong to Jesus, we're wearing the uniform of the enemy. And Jesus says, why would you want to wear the enemy's uniform? Why do you want to be out in the merge lane? Why do you want to be like the world? It ends in destruction. It doesn't end in life. This world has got it wrong. Jesus has it right. We, through these difficulties, it helps us be delivered from that thinking that sends us down the wrong path. Verse 5, he says, or do you think it's without reason? The scripture says, and of course he's asking a rhetorical question and he's answering it, that the spirit who lives in us yearns jealously for us. What that means is as a believers in Christ, the Holy Spirit that he put in you when he made you a new creation in him, the Spirit of God has intense desires for us to experience victory. To rise above the construction zones of this life, to recognize what they're about, and instead of getting impatient with them, instead of complaining about them, instead of getting angry about them, we say God's at work in my life, he's forming his life in me. And in the midst of that difficulty, we can experience what is known as the joy or the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. The fruit of the Spirit. Galatians, the fifth chapter says, but the fruit of the Spirit is this. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. All these things that we display while we're watching those people go by in the merge lane. Against such things, there is no law. So we find out that anger comes from a worldly viewpoint. And we need to, in these difficulties, recognize that God's weaning us 
He's trying to get us out of that worldly mindset, this me-focused thing, into a him-focused mindset so that we can look at this life and this world through his eyes and see that our world around us is crying out, somebody, somebody please tell me the truth to this mess. Because you know what? We all share with those people sitting in line in that construction zone. They don't like it either. But they have no answer. At least we know what God's doing. Wouldn't it be great if everybody in that line knew what God's doing? Yeah. They would love to hear. But we're too busy complaining about being in the line. That we've lost sight of those around us. Like they're better off somehow. Oh, no, they're not. So the first thing, anger comes from a world of viewpoint. Second thing, anger comes from a proud attitude. Why are those people in that lane not merging? Because at their core, they really think they're better than the people they're driving by. They do. And that's why there's every time you, I mean, if it's four lanes to three, which we should just scoot through, comes to a complete standstill. Why? Because this is epidemic in our world, this proud attitude. He says in verse 6, but he gives greater grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So what we just read in the previous verse, that the Spirit of God has this divine jealousy over us. He wants us to allow him to have his way with us so that we can grow in grace. And so divine jealousy brings what? It brings grace into our life. But human jealousy brings what? Revenge. I'm going to get even. I'm going to take that person down a notch. I'm going to make sure they feel it. I'm gonna, they might pass those other people, but they're not passing me. And we move over halfway into the lane. Yeah. Or if you're a semi-truck driver, you just get completely over in the lane. Because who's going to hit a semi-truck? Right? And when I see semi-truck drivers do that, what do I do? Yes. Good man. Good woman, whoever's driving that truck, I love you. It must be a Christian. (laughs) Making sure none of those jerks, I mean people, get ahead of us. Yeah, the great equalizer. I think you're going to remember that of everything in the message. Okay. Well, think about this. This is a quote from Proverbs the third chapter that was written 2,000 years, I'm sorry, 600 years beforehand, where King Solomon writes that God mocks those who mock but gives grace to the humble. Now think about this. Who are the people that come into a salvation relationship with Jesus Christ? The ones that are proud or the ones that voluntarily say, I'm not deserving of it. There's nothing I could do to earn this. I am guilty of sin. I I am deserving of condemnation and judgment, but God, please forgive me. As soon as we humble ourselves, what does God do? He pours his grace on us and raises us up. He does. So if you're in the difficulty in the midst of a trial right now and you're you're grinding under it and you're talking and that's and now you're angry and you're, you're Don't you understand he's going after that mindset and he's going after that pride that's tripping us up. Pride actually gets in the way of us experiencing the wonder of God in our daily life. More when we are at the point in our life where everybody owes me, including God, we're at the end of the line of getting any grace. It's the moment that we say, I don't deserve anything from God, that when he starts pouring grace into our life. It says, God resists those that are proud. He resists those that say, I'm owed. 
He resists those that say, well, God, you have to. He resists that. He resists it. Verses 7 through 10, it tells us, because this is true, therefore, instead of getting in the Murs lane, trying to even things out, he says, instead, submit to God. That means yield or humble yourself, defer to God, but resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, double-minded people. Be miserable and mourn and weep, and your laughter must change to mourning, your joy to sorrow. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and you're going to be miserable? No. We already stated, and we've already come to the conclusion that most Christians are already miserable. So I guess the, the famous way of saying that today, the popular way is, so how's that working out for us? So if it's not working, why don't we try what God says? Humble ourselves before the Lord and look at what happens. And he, God, will make it his business to exalt you, to lift you up. So here's what humility means. In these verses, 7 through 10, he describes humility. And here's humility. First of all, it means submission. Submission. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says that it is since we have experienced the mercy of God, it is just, it's, it's just a common understanding that we should surrender our lives to the authority of Christ, that we should be living sacrifices to the God that saved us. Amen. Living sacrifices. And Paul writes there, it's just reasonable. It's reasonable. Since we are the recipients of such a great forgiveness and mountain of grace through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, he says it's only reasonable that we surrender, we yield, we humble our life to Jesus from that point on. And then the other one is resistance. We not only submit to God, but at the same time we resist the thinking that this world and Satan presses into us. And that's what he always does. In Romans, it says he tries to press us into the mold. But instead, we submit to God. Yeah. Now, think about what this world tries to do. When you're sitting there at that line, feeling like a chump, right? That's what I feel like. Like, man, I'm a chump. And I don't want to, I don't drive a semi, so I don't put my car out there because I know some uninsured driver is going to hit me. Right? Don't tell me I'm not the only one thinking that. And so what do I do? I sit there and I start feeling like, man, this doesn't get me ahead. It just gets my goat. It gets me off track. I start hating the people driving by. I start justifying that. I say, they're wrong, they're wrong. And it, maybe when they're driving right, wrong, 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 wrong. Get them, God, get them. <laughs> get them, nails, nails in that lane, nails in that lane. <laughs> You're like, man, pastor, you have just totally unearthed a whole thing I didn't know that was going on in your mind. <laughs> yeah. You can check my trunk after. I do not, I do not carry a box of nails with me. We have to resist that. We resist it by submitting to God. And what does Timothy say? There are certain things, circumstances, and mindsets that we should, Timothy says, we should just flee from. Not wrestle with it, not think of it, just run from it. He says, flee immoral lust. Flee certain things. And other things, we can't just run from them. We have to resist them. We have to put boundaries in our life and say, not, no, not going there. Not going to do that. And that's what humility means. And in the process of submitting to God, resisting the evil one, we do what? We can then draw near. Well, how do we draw near to God? He just said, first of all, we cleanse our hands. What do we do with our hands? Our actions, instead of giving them the one way to Jesus, cleanse our hands. That means 
Our actions should mimic the actions of Christ. And what was the other? Purify our what? Our thoughts, our hearts. How do we do that? Washing it with the Word. It tells us that the Word of God is the only thing powerful enough to change our mindset. And so he says, purify your hands, our actions, cleanse our thoughts, and this brings what? It brings inner revival. It brings inner revival. We are renewed and revived in the process of the difficulty. You know, when they take those barrels down and you're driving down that newly paved road, it's like, no potholes. Isn't that nice? You're like, oh, yeah. But man, we don't think about that while we're, we're not, we're not thinking about what God's going to produce in our life. Right. We're only thinking, man, it's taking so long. <clears throat> yeah, at the end of Paul's life, he said, I'm still under construction. Amen. Yeah. He said, the Lord's going to take me any moment, but I'm still under construction. Yes, he wrote most of the New Testament, yeah. but he said, I'm still under construction. Amen. God's still weaning me of this. He's still doing the work in my life. And so verses 11 and 12, this is very common when we're under pressure and we see no way out. He says, don't criticize one another, brothers. He who criticizes a brother or judges his brother criticizes the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's one lawgiver and judge who's able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? <laughs> Say, I, I, I try not to judge. I really... And, and so what we do is we, we say not judging is the absence of any standards in our life. That's not what, that's not what it means. Right. Here's what not judging means. When I'm sitting there already merged, and those people are flying by in that lane, here's what judgment is. They're going by, and I'm sitting there thinking, I'm better than that guy, 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 I'm better than that Because I am, I'm better, because I'm over in the merge lane. I'm, I'm merged. I'm better. I'm way better. Go to hell, go to hell, go to hell, go to hell. <laughs> I'm better. Now, there's some people in the world, and let's just be honest. We're not going to shed any tears when Judgment Day comes. You might work with those people. You might live by those people. You might be related to those people. Uh-oh. I'm not going to say you might be married to that person, but... <laughs> he says, be careful. God is the only one that can judge. Boy, that, that feeling of moral and ethical and spiritual superiority just deadens us for the lost. Deadens us. When we start feeling superior, we lose our heart for the gospel. And church becomes more of a country club than a soul-saving hospital. Because the church is supposed to go after the lost. All the people out in that, those selfish people out in the merge lane, that's our mission field. So if we're sitting there feeling morally superior and hating on them, how are we going to win them? Right. Amen. Oh, man, that's way too practical, isn't it? That's a big gulp moment. And so he goes after making plans in life. This is the ultimate pride, making plans in life without considering him. He says, verse 13, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow will travel to such and such a city, spend a year there, do business, make a profit. You don't even know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be. For you're like smoke that appears, vapor. It appears for a little while and vanishes. Instead, you should say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. James then warns us against planning life. Now, that doesn't mean, oh, we're never supposed to make plans. That's not what it said. And then some Christians take this and say, okay, I'm going to make my plans and then just say, blessed Jesus, we're over there in the merge lane, in the mess, out of his will, saying, bless it. No, that's not what it means. 
Okay? He's not warning against plans. What he's warning us against is forgetting the most inevitable thing when making your plans. What is that? God. When you make a future plan in your life and you forget who holds the future, what kind of plan is that? If you plan next week and you forget the God who's going to make sure next week happens, what kind of plan is that? We better put the God who holds tomorrow in the midst of our plans. Because he says to do that, to not do that is arrogant. And he says it's evil. The preeminent fact of life is I really don't know what tomorrow holds. And I don't know if I'm going to be part of it. But he does. And so make your plans based on what God, who he is, and what he can do. Verse 17 So it is a sin for the person who knows to do what is good and doesn't do it. So for us to know that we're here to build the kingdom, to share the good news of Jesus Christ, that's the gospel, the good news of Christ, and to, and to do it to everybody that's in our life, to know that and to remove ourselves from that. He said that's a harmartia, the Greek word for sin there. And this sin doesn't mean that we fell into a hole it doesn't mean that uh, we have premeditated. What it means is, harmartia is the Greek word, which means that an arrow has missed its mark. God has a plan for each and every one of our lives. He is jealously trying to bring that plan to fruition in all of our lives. And you know what? He's got seven billion people and counting, and he's got it all. He's got a plan for all of them. How oh, they all works together. He's that great a God. Yes, sir. And here we are, his kids, fighting his plan. And so he's saved us. He's made us an arrow in his whatever you call the thing that arrows go in. The arrow holder. I'm such an outdoorsman. <laughs> so he's made you specifically. He has a target he wants you to hit. And to know that and to excuse ourselves from the process through talking and getting angry, he says, it's the sin of omission, of not allowing him to use us to hit what he wants in our life. Pride overlooks its own failure, specifically lacking submission to God's will. Here's the exciting thing about surrendering to God's will. He's got a better life plan for you than you could ever dream or imagine. Yes, sir. He does. We write that, Cindy and I write that on every graduation card we give out, every marriage card. When our young people get married, we write right on the card. You place Christ in the midst of your life together. He will bless you beyond your dreams and imagination. Why? Because that's what he says in his word. He's got this unbelievable life of impact for all of us. But we're stuck over in the merge lane complaining about construction. And we're forgetting to live. Forgetting to live. I hope today, in your conclusion... I hope that we hit the mark, allow God to have his way with us through that construction zone and hit the target for which God has called us for. He's got a purpose in your life. He has you here in this building today for a reason. He does. Don't just kind of, oh, this is what I do on Sunday. I go to church. And then church has become a club. It's become a club. When we forget that God's Holy Spirit uses his word to actually bring about structural change to who we are and how we think and how we live, we miss the whole point of coming to church. But if we allow that process to happen in this room this morning, we can go change the world we live in. <laughs> now, that's exciting, isn't it? Lives can be changed for an eternity out there. Whose lives? 
the lives that you encounter this week. Amen. The lives you encounter, those people driving by, you can, you can affect their lives for all eternity. Now that's living. Amen. That's living. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes and the musicians come up. As the Holy Spirit is speaking within your heart today, would you say, Pastor Tom, I felt like well, this message was just for me. It's so much of it resonated with my life, and I need to change my mindset, the direction of my life, my thinking, my actions. I'm going to ask God to cleanse my heart. I'm asking God for nothing less than revival to take place, for me to get back on track with what I'm here for, to share the good news of Jesus Christ, to grow them up in the faith so they can go share the good news. That makes living the Christian life absolutely eternity changing and altering. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if that's your prayer this morning, right before I pray, just slip your hand up and say, include me in that prayer, God. I humble myself before you right now. Right now, hands all over. <clears throat> Maybe you're sitting here today and you're not sure whether or not you're in that relationship with Christ. Oh, you know about him or you wouldn't be sitting in church today. <clears throat> but you've never humbled yourself like we talked about today. And come to him as a guilty sinner. Say, God, I do not deserve to be forgiven but you died for me and I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. And you confess that and repent and turn. And if you'd like to do that, if you're tired of the lane that you're in and you recognize that God brought you here today to begin a relationship with him by fully trusting him, I would love to pray for you today too. If that's your prayer today, you've never done it before, would you be so bold? Just lift your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me. I've never done it before. Yes, ma'am. Awesome. You don't have to keep your hand up. And if I don't see it, that's okay, too. Because God's reading your heart. Let's stand to our feet. And let's pray together. Father God, for those that raise their hand and are praying right now and ask you for forgiveness of sin, they're confessing their need to be forgiven, and repenting and turning from their sin toward a saving God. And I just pray, Lord, that your grace would just wash over them, make them new, a new creation in you. Place your Holy Spirit within them so they can be guided through life from that point on. And Lord, for those of us that might have become stale in the process of the, the trials that you're place in our life to improve us. Lord, redeem us from that me-based viewpoint. Redeem us from being so angry that all we can see is what we are or are not getting and what others are getting that I'm not getting. And Lord, forgive us from being prideful and looking down at the world that does not know you and instead of looking at them through your eyes and your heart saying they need what I have we keep it to ourselves Lord cleanse us of that pride and use us to change people's lives this week we pray in Jesus holy name if we pray with me today church say amen amen, amen. let's sing today we won't move without Jesus Never change.